I want to continue this series that we started a few weeks ago called Unstoppable. And we have talked about Acts chapter 1 and dealt with some things out of Acts chapter 2 last week. And today I want us to drop down, really jump over to Acts chapter 8 and pick up. And if you would like to, you can read along with me at the beginning of this chapter. As we see some things beginning to unfold and how it eventually affects the church. And it affects the church perhaps in a way that is unexpected. So if you would like to read along with me, Acts chapter 8, verse 2. 1 through 3. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed with the killing of Stephen. And a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all of the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women. I want you to get that visual. It's a rather difficult visual to get, but I mean, it's written pretty clearly. It's just fairly graphic. The, the thought and vision of that. But it says that Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church, and he went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Now, what I want us to talk about today is what effect does that persecution have on this unstoppable church that experiences the work and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Will you pray with me today? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. The power and the anointing that is in that word. And I pray, Father, that that word would go out and go forth. I pray, Father, that it would minister to those that need to receive it today. I pray, Father, that this word would be encouraging and uplifting and at the same time challenging to us, Father. Let it mold us and shape us into who we should be, what we should be. I pray, Father, that we can draw courage and boldness from it. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do. And the church said, Amen and Amen. I want to thank you again for being here. Now, as you remember, two weeks ago we began this series, Unstoppable. The graphics changed a little bit, same series. But, um, but this concept of what we're talking about is this church of Acts, as the gospel began to spread, how God used it in incredible ways and moved in incredible ways see this fire start and cover the area of Judea and Samaria and Israel and up into the Gentile nations of Rome and Galatia and, and and God used this as the launching pad for what is the Christian church today and and so as we see in chapter one promise was given and then in chapter two we get a glimpse of what the early church, the, the, the birthing of the church looked like, how they acted, what were their priorities, some of the things that defined them as the church. But we go a few chapters, and as we go a few chapters, it's time passes on. And when we get to chapter 7 and 8, you've passed probably a year, maybe two or three years at this time. Uh, no, really not much more than that. But when we get to chapter 7, some things began to change. You see, up until then, the church had faced ridicule. They had faced threats, but they really had not faced physical persecution. But the close of chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, we read about the first Christian martyr whose name was Stephen. Stephen preaches, and... He preaches some things that they don't want to hear. And it says as they are listening to him, these religious leaders of that day began to cover their ears. 
because they are so frustrated with what he is saying and what he is doing. And finally, they chase him to the edge of the city, and there they pick up stones and they stone him. Now, that may seem unrelatable. I don't know. It may be relatable, but it may seem unrelatable to you. But they physically, literally picked up rocks and threw them at Stephen until it killed him. And beyond that, not only did it kill him, but as we move over to chapter 8, it says this, Saul was one of the witnesses there. Now, he was a religious zealot at that time. We know later that he finds conversion. But at this time, he is against Christianity. He does not like the spread of this gospel. And it says that Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Stephen. And then it says a great wave of persecution began on the church. What it does is it gives us this insight that for whatever this scene may have looked like, the approval of Stephen and the acceptance of the other people that this had actually been stoned to death and it was accepted, it was okay, was a message to everybody else that did not want to hear this gospel. It became a message to them that they could also persecute the church of that day. And so... What it tells us is that this great wave of persecution begins on the Christian faith. Before this, the church had experienced some persecution, but it was minor. Again, it was through threats. It was um, maybe being arrested if things were stretched, um, spending a night or two in jail and then being released. But now that Stephen was martyred, the level of oppression began to rise. And anyone preaching the gospel might face the same fate that Stephen faced. Now, everyone here is logical enough, I believe, to understand that once you cross that line, that society accepts it. It changes things, right? And so this is one of those cultural moments where the society at large looks around and they see this happen, this this gross unjust action happened where this this preacher of the gospel was killed simply for preaching the gospel and telling them that their faith was wrong and so as a result everyone kind of accepts that okay now it's it's open field right and so the church begins to face open physical persecution in Acts chapter 1 verse uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 3 informs us of a few things. Number one, it says Paul approved of it. It says great persecution breaks out against the church in Jerusalem, primarily there in Jerusalem, because up until that moment, Jerusalem had been the head of the church, the central part of the gospel and on from the death and Jesus Christ. But it says that great persecution breaks out there on the church in Jerusalem, and godly men buried Steve, Stephen, and they mourned deeply for him. And then it says that Paul took this as a, an acceptable means to then go and persecute the church from house to house, drag people out of their homes and arrest them and send them to prison. So everything is beginning to change for the followers of Jesus. And remember, most of these followers are new in their faith. There are some who have been following Jesus two and three years prior to his death. But a lot of these followers have come to faith on the day of Pentecost. Remember on the day of Pentecost, it was then that they preached and it says that 3,000 came to salvation. And following that, in the following few chapters, you see others that have come to the faith. And so these are people who are somewhat new to their faith. And you might think that this persecution on the church, because I'm a believer that, that if you're ever trying to do anything advanceful in life, period, you're going to face obstacles and you're going to, at times, face persecution. And especially if you're doing things for the kingdom of God. And, and so what happens to this unstoppable group of people who have accepted Jesus Christ and who have been, abled, been enabled 
by the power and the work of the gifts of the Spirit, and they are going out to teach and to preach and to share the good news of the gospel, they begin to face persecution. And the, t- the question is, how will they respond to the test? What will it cause within the church? Will the church respond by shrinking away, huddling up in their rooms like the disciples did after Jesus was arrested, Or will it make a change? Remember two weeks ago when we started this series, I I gave you an illustration of what disciples looked like between that section of time when Jesus was arrested and when he was raised from the dead, things began to change. But then, when they get over to the day of Pentecost some 50 days later, and they have the enablement and empowerment of the Holy Spirit, everything changed. Their attitude, their attitude much more bold. They began preaching the gospel in a different way. And there we see the church just kind of explode. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, there were people that were gathered from different areas. And they heard those 120 that were gathered speak in different languages, in their own native tongues and languages, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they go back home and testify of this in their native language. They gather some time and then the persecution happens. So does the church shrink back within their walls? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible gives me a few indications in chapter 8 of some things that happen during persecution here. Number one, persecution can be a catalyst and was a catalyst here for spreading the gospel message. You see, here's what what happens and what we read. It says in verse 1, it says... And a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all of the believers, except the apostles, were scattered. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to come back to it in a minute. But it says that everybody but the apostles scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And so an incredible thing happens. Persecution that is intended to push them back within the walls of their their homes and where they believed was something that spread them out, which was a good thing, because by being spread out, they were able to share and spread the gospel in areas that it was not receiving the gospel. Because what it says is that everybody was spread out into Judea and Samaria, and they, they, they didn't just stay in Jerusalem and try to walk over the top of the apostles, they spread out into other areas. And up to this point, Jerusalem had been the center of the church. And that's not to say that the kingdom of God had not infiltrated other cities or was not preached at all in other cities. However, after the stoning of Stephen, the kingdom of God would spread more rapidly than it had in the previous year or two since the day of Pentecost. It wasn't because of a strategic planning session by the apostles. It wasn't because the board got together and said, here's what I think the best thing to do is. No, it's because persecution comes in on the church and the persecution scatters the believers. Persecution, at least in this sense, does to the church what wind does to seed. And it spreads it. You see it scatters it so that it can produce a better harvest, a greater harvest. The word translated scattered, depending on what translation you're reading that in, means, if you're reading out of King James, I think it may say disperse. But that word there from the original Greek means to scatter seed. The idea of it is that persecution worked like a a broadcast spreader. I, I don't know if you know what a spreader is and a broadcast spreader but there's a drop spreader and then there are broadcast spreaders now I've got a broadcast spreader a little small one and what that is is when I want to fertilize my lawn or when I want to put out some weed and feed if I want to uh, whatever I want to put out on my lawn I pour it in there in this container it's got a little just a little bucket almost like a miniature wheel uh, wheelbarrow and when I hold that handle and walk behind it and push it forward there's a little wheel under the bottom of it and it sprinkles the seed out onto that wheel depending on what speed I want it to. I've got a dial on there and that wheel just spins. And what happens are those seeds are spread 
they are thrown out into the yard about three foot on each side of that spreader. And so I'll make my paths and come back. That's the idea of this word, again, depending on the translation you're reading out of, dispersed um, or it, it, it dispersia or scattered. If you're reading from a more modern translation, the idea of that is that what happened was not that they were pushed back home and hid. No, what happened was that they were spread out across Judea and Samaria, and there they began to live out the gospel and to preach the gospel and to teach the gospel. And that began to transform lives. He even gives us an example in this of what happens with that. You see, the believers in Jerusalem were God's seed, and the persecution was used to spread them throughout the area so that they could share the message of Jesus Christ. Some went throughout Judea and Samaria, Acts chapter 1 tells us, and others went to more distant fields, Acts chapter 11 indicates. Persecution, through that, propelled the growth of the church. Verse 4 says that those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And because of that, the gospel grew. The church, I want you to hear something in this. Here's what persecution did. It scattered the seed, and by scattering the seed, it scattered the message. And by doing that, the church became more diverse. Yet at the same time, it became more unified. You see, if, if I could make this point an illustration to you, the church in those times of persecution often becomes more diverse. Why? Because the message has a tendency in those times of persecution of going places that it would not have gone before. And the work of God goes forward in places that perhaps it may not have before. But in that diversity... God develops a unity. You see, here's what happens is when they go to Judea and especially into Samaria, if you know the history of the Jewish people, you understand that Samaria was located believe, right along in between Israel and Judah. And they were considered um, non-Jews. And there was a lot of hostility and a lot of tension between many of the Jewish people and many of the Samaritan people. It was there that many of these people landed and they began to preach the gospel. And while they preached the gospel, it became more diverse and people accepted the gospel from many different places. In fact, chapter 8 alone gives us great indication of the diversity of the church as it grew. Because it talks about Samaria, which is its first etchings outside of the Jewish faith and Israelite people into some that were uh, of mixed religions and they were... Uh, not considered fully Jewish people, and great hostility there. The end of chapter 8 talks, and we'll get to that in a moment, minute, but it talks about Philip witnessing to an Ethiopian who then takes the message. You see, he was a converted, a proselyte. He was proselyted to Judaism, and he comes to it, Jerusalem so that he can be a part of the temple and serve some duties there, and he's on his way back home, and he gets one to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in doing so, he carries the gospel message all the way back to Ethiopia. Here, just in chapter 8, you see the message spread out into the areas of Judea and Samaria and even to Ethiopia. Because during this time of persecution, what they do is they say, we have to spread out and share this gospel. And so they get out of Jerusalem, and in doing that, they preach the gospel, talk about the word of God, and God uses that as an opportunity to convert people and see people saved. Not only do they see them saved, but they see many people filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the church doesn't hide, but because of their faith, the church gets stronger. Now, I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, you see, another thing that, that persecution has a tendency to do to the church is not only spread it out, but it, persecution has a tendency to draw clear boundaries. See if I can explain what I mean when I say it draws clear boundaries. It demands that people choose a side. When you're going through times of persecution, no longer can you be hid and quiet in the corner and unopinionated. Does that, that make sense? 
I, I'm just going to... I'm just going to tell you, one of the most comfortable places in the church is among tall weeds. <laughs> I can tell you didn't get that. What I meant is that one of the most comfortable places you can be in the church is to be at a place where all the, the dynamics and the relational politics can take place and you can just sit quietly, unopinionated uninvested and you can say to yourself okay when they got it all worked out then I'll come we'll fellowship we'll have a good time and move on to the next thing but persecution does not allow that because what persecution does is it requires everybody to come to the forefront and then everyone to call, draw clear boundaries of if you are in the faith or not in the faith you see two great examples of that here in this passage first you see Simon so what happens is this it says that Philip was one of these that is there in Samaria and he preaches the gospel and some come to the faith and then he calls other of the he calls the apostles two of the apostles to come and they pray over him they receive the holy spirit with gifts and signs and Simon now please understand Simon was not one at this point this is not Saul Simon he's not persecuting the church it indicates in chapter 8 that he saw this and began to receive it and follow it but when he saw them in filled with the Holy Spirit, he asked the leaders of the church, the apostles, he says, how can I have that? He doesn't want the Holy Spirit. What he wants is he wants the ability to infill others. Because what it says is those apostles came and they laid hands on the people and the people received the gift of the Spirit. And what Simon says is, oh, man. That is awesome. How can I do that? I'll pay you. How much will it cost me? And the response is, keep your evil money. It's not for sale. This is something that you cannot buy. Philip states that this gift cannot be bought. And it demands a decision. We do not find what uh, Simon's response was to this, but the power comes only through repentance and redemption. And what is said here is the leaders look at Simon and they say, repent of your evil deeds and your sins is what needs to happen. He's saying that the only way you're going to have the available uh, working of this power in your life is to, to, to draw a line, to say, okay, I'm in. I give my life to Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of my life. Man, th this right here could, could preach for a week, I think. Because his message to Simon, it's not that money is evil. I mean, there are other places in Scripture where God talks about blessing people with money, right? Right? But what these leaders are saying is the only way that you're going to be a part of this is you cannot buy your way, and money does not buy that. The only way that can happen is through redemption. What he was saying to Simon was you have to draw a line. You have to either surrender your life to him and him be the Lord of your life. Now hear me what I'm saying. He's got to be the Lord of your life. Or you need to get on the other side of the line. You see, me too many times we in the church are exactly right there. We want to stand over here and receive the good blessings that God has. We want the gifts and the power and the anointing and the blessing. We want God to bless us financially. We want God to bless us with friends. But then we want to stand over here and do what we want to do, how we want to do it. And what, what he says to Simon is, your money is no good here. Matter of fact, it's evil in this process. That, that this is a process that the only way it happens is through the redemption of the work of God. And, and, and so he says to Simon that you have to surrender your life to Jesus and let him be the Lord of your life. Philip says, I can see that you are held captive by sin. Statement of peace to Simon. The other example that I see here is down through in, chat, in verse 26 through 40 where it talks about this Ethiopian and what happens is that, that Philip 
was directed by an angel and then the Holy Spirit to witness to this man as this man was traveling back to his homeland. And <laughs> it's quite intriguing, and, and I'll expound on this in just a few seconds, but the angel of the Lord tells him to go out and kind of stand and wait in the middle of nowhere. Philip does it. But in doing that, it leads him to this process where he ministers to this Ethiopian, and in doing so, this man gives his life to Jesus Christ. Here's the things that I would draw from that. This man was a dedicated and devoted man of faith. The Bible makes it clear that this was a man of faith. This was a religious man. This man believed in the God of Judaism. In fact, this man had traveled a long distance so that he could serve a certain period of time in the temple and fulfill his obligation of his faith. This was not an unrighteous man. This was not a heathen. This was a devout man. He was a man that, from his upbringing, again, was probably Gentile and did not have the faith from that, but he had been converted over to the Jewish faith and accepted this God of Israel. And so on his way back, he's reading, he, as he's in Jerusalem serving at the temple, he, he obviously hears all of these stories about Jesus and what has happened and him being crucified and raised from the dead and uh, believers and followers coming in. And so what happens is on his way home, he's wondering about this. And as he's traveling home, he's reading, I think it was from the prophecies of Isaiah that he's reading from. And he has questions on it. And he's wondering, what does this mean? And so God sends Philip up near his cart and has him walk beside him. So he asks Philip. Philip tells him. The man ends up giving his life to Jesus Christ. Here's the point that I want to make out of that. It's obvious that it's not enough to be righteous. It's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to be devout. Again, this requires a process of redemption. This requires a time of accepting Jesus Christ and asking for the forgiveness of sins. This is a time where uh, Simon wanted to buy his way into a right relationship with God. He wanted to buy his way actually into receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. And the message from Philip was, does it come that way? It only comes through a relationship. He was drawing a line and saying, you have to decide what side you're on. Philip was saying to the Ethiopian eunuch, he was saying, you have to decide if you're just going to be religious and devout and go to the temple and go through your duties or if you're going to have a right relationship with God, if you're going to know him and ask him to forgive you of your sins and ask Jesus into your life to become the Lord of your life. You see, persecution has a tendency to do that. One thing that I find with persecution is per persecution, it propels the growth of the church, but it does it because the church, because persecution often requires us to draw clear boundaries and know where we stand on issues. And then it makes us choose whether those issues are strong enough to step across the line or not. That is a very uncomfortable place to be. Some people are more comfortable there than others. But it's not comfortable for anyone. I can tell you, I consider those places to be very troubling places to be. Yet persecution requires that, and if we choose the right thing to step on that side and stand up in the faith and the will and the word of God, then what God does is he blesses us and he honors us because of it. And what happens out of that is not only does church become more diverse, but the church becomes more unified and stronger. Well, see, what happens is although the church spreads out, the persecution is requiring the drawing of lines. So that people decide where they stand with the Lord. And that always causes people to be more unified. You see, here's what happened. Is that I may not agree with you about everything. 
But if I know that we're on the same page, we can get twice as much done as if we're working against one another. Right? And I I don't know about you, but I've been in those places. I've been in those places in work environments. I've been in those places in church environments. It's a struggle. It's filled with tension. It's not intended to be, but it is. But once you make the decision of here's where that line is drawn, it's clear. There's no returning. This is where I stand. I'm with Jesus. All of a sudden, everything gets a little bit clearer. Right? And all of a sudden, you know who's walking with you, and you know who's not. And I want, I'm just being honest with you. That's a good thing. I, I, I do. I believe that that's a healthy thing. Because too often, we spend the majority of our lives in strife with people that we're not in agreement with. And what I... Oh, help me, Jesus. But it, it is a good thing when we know that we're unified. And what happens here through this persecution is that the church is spread and it becomes more diverse. But it also gets stronger because it gets more unified. What I mean by more unified is... No longer are they preaching small messages within Jerusalem, but they're preaching them everywhere. Jesus saves, and you're either with Jesus or you're not. You either accept him or you don't. You see, here's what happens with the church. is It's interesting, prayers throughout the book of Acts. Their prayers throughout the book of Acts are not, God, remove the persecution. You read it throughout the New Testament. When they are facing persecution, and the persecution from this point for the next 30 or 40 years continues to mount, continues to mount, and then it all of a sudden just explodes at the burning of Rome. Because although the Christians didn't have anything to do with it, they got the blame for it. And in all of that growth, as the church is facing more and more mounting perse- persecution, the church is growing wildly at the same time. Multiply. And their prayer is not, God, remove the persecution. If you could remove the persecution, then we could do more for you. I don't know about you, but that would be my prayer. Can I just be, can I just be real with you? I think that would be my first prayer, to go into my office and say, Lord, I know you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. However it needs to happen, can you remove the persecution? Shut the mouth of the lions, right? That's not their prayer. What their prayer is, God, give us boldness. Give us strength and courage. Repeatedly you hear that prayer. As a part of their prayers is, God, give us boldness to proclaim your word. In the face of persecution, God, give us boldness. When they see Stephen Stone, God, give us boldness. When the church comes under persecution and they're blamed for the burning of earth, God, give us boldness. And as they do, the church begins to spread and multiply and grow. Why? Because God uses this time of persecution to spread the gospel into Samaria and Judea and to other places as it's preached. And then God makes the church stronger because it falls or clear boundary lines, and people decide which side they're on. Final thing that I would say is this. Persecution often provides the church and the child of God with an opportunity to step up. Let me see if I can explain what I mean. So persecution scatters them. It spreads them everywhere. It says, everyone but the apostles. Now, up until that time, I've mentioned to you and told you that the gospel was largely largely preached within Jerusalem, the center of the faith. But at the center of the faith, the apostles could do a large portion of the leading of the church. They do bring in some deacons to help cover the ministry so that the apostles then could go out and spread the gospel. The deacons could handle some of the day-to-day business of the church, right? But what happens is when the church gets spread out, the apostles can't do it all. And it says that the Bible, the Bible tells us that everybody was spread around Judea and Samaria into other areas 
except the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Now, they eventually began some missionary journeys in the leading of the church, but they did it from Jerusalem. And God then miraculously began to work through everyone else instead of relying solely on the apostles. Here's what I would say to you, is that if our concept and idea of the calling of the Lord is simply on those who have been called and anointed by a denomination or carry a certificate, we have the misunderstanding of what the gospel is all about. Because God desires to use everyone in every way that he can to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ when he can. Verse 1 tells us, and all of the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. He still chooses to use people of ordinary means to do extraordinary work. The prayer from these followers, as I've mentioned to you in Acts, were not God remove the persecution, but God give us boldness so that we can better do the work that you've called us to. You see, these believers, not just the apostles, but all of the believers were being filled with the Holy Spirit and the enablements of the Holy Spirit. And they were not just for the apostles or for the primary church leaders. These gifts and enablements were for everyone that was there so that they could share the gospel of Jesus Christ where they went. And, and, and the New Testament gives us a bountiful list of all of those different things that God worked through them with enablements on. Every follower of Jesus has the privilege and the opportunity and the responsibility to be a witness of Jesus. We learn in Acts chapter 1 that the purpose of the infilling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit was so that they could be witnesses themselves. He was not simply talking only to the apostles. That message was for all that would receive. In fact, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it wasn't just the apostles or the disciples that were there. It was 120 that were gathered on that day that received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It was so that they could go where God sends them. The task is not just reserved for church leaders, nor is the power of God only upon the pastor or only upon the pulpit. God uses everyone to extend the kingdom where he can in cafes, workplaces, in parks, in neighborhoods, where God can, he uses you and enables you so that you can spread the gospel. That's how the gospel spreads so rapidly, is that no longer simply dependent on the leadership of the apostles that were in Jerusalem, but as these people were spread out everywhere, they began to preach the gospel and talk about the message and tell people about this good news, and God began to use them. The other example that we find of this before I close is the story that I told you earlier about the Ethiopian eunuch. This story takes place in verse 26 through 40, and here the Holy Spirit directs the work through Philip. And I want to draw your attention to something in this. It says this in verse 26. It says, The angel of the Lord said to him, to Philip, Go south. So he tells him to go south. He tells him to go out in this area and wait. And he sees this man traveling by. And then it says in verse 29, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk alongside of him. Now, please just imagine this with me. And I don't want to delay this. I don't want to carry this out too long. But I just want you to imagine this with me. What if God just calls you one day, let's say a Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, go to Food Line. Okay, what do you want me to do, Lord, at Food Line? Just go. Just stand in the parking lot and I'll tell you what to do. Sure. It's not so bad. So you go to Food Line and you're standing there. And you see this man or this woman get out of the car and walk into food line. And you feel the Holy Spirit say to you, don't say anything, just go up and walk beside him. You mind if I, you mind if you help me, Miss Rhonda? So just imagine you're pushing a cart. Oh. Can you imagine what it'd be like to just walk up, don't say a word? And then, that's exactly right. Thank you. And if she turns down one aisle, you walk beside her. And if she turns down another aisle, you don't say a word. You just walk beside her until she pulls out her phone and calls 911. That's what Philip is asked to do by the Holy Spirit. Now I want to draw your attention to something in this. Here's what happens as this story unfolds. So the angel of the Lord in verse 26 says, go south and wait. So he goes, he waits. 
this man comes along in verse 29, the Holy Spirit speaks, leans on Philip and says, just go up and walk beside him. So he does. And this man looks over and he says, I've been reading this scripture out of Isaiah. He said, and I don't know, he said in relationship to this thing about the Messiah, and I know that he was supposed to be, uh, the, the Messiah was supposed to be a sacrifice. And, and, and just, what does that mean? At that moment, Philip has to feel like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I imagine there was a great sense of relief that came off of his shoulders thinking, now it all makes sense, Father. Up until that moment, it had to be a little bit awkward. But the thing that I want to get to you and I want you to understand is this. Could not the Holy Spirit have spoken to this man without the use of Philip? Certainly he could have. As this man was obviously sincere in what he was trying to understand from Old Testament prophecies and the relation to the Messiah and what they were saying had happened to Jesus and does it tie together? Does it have anything to do with one another? What does it all mean? Could not the Holy Spirit have stopped him on his path? Yes, yeah, certainly he could have. Yet the Holy Spirit chooses to use Philip to go out of his way. It's not that Philip just happened to be there and so God uses him. No. It's that God sends Philip out of his way when God himself could have done that same thing. Why? Because God desires to use me and you. And persecution often provides the church an opportunity to step forward so that we can see God work through us and in us in new ways that we did not expect or we had never seen before. And in this moment, they simply followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when the man asked the question, it all makes sense to Philip. Philip explains this story to him. God invites us to partner with him in extending his kingdom on this earth. God continues to use unqualified, inexperienced, and under-resourced people to extend the kingdom on earth. Miss Sandra, if you could help me. Steve Addis wrote in a book that's entitled What Jesus Started. He says this, As the story of Acts unfolds, we see that ordinary people were the key players in the spread of the gospel. I want you to get that. Certainly we know that Paul, who was not one of the apostles at the time, later may have been qualified as one, but at this time he was persecuting the church. And the apostles that are there in Jerusalem beginning to lead the church, we know that they had influential effects on the spread of the gospel. But it's obvious when you read the book of Acts that it was ordinary people who were dispersed in different places that began to share the gospel. Even when you look at the life of Paul, it was Paul who went into different places on his missionary journeys. He would stay for six months, a year, two years. He would plant a church a house church. Those believers would come together and start believing and then he would move on to the next place and he would raise up a person there, a leader there, just an ordinary person. Many of their names we don't even know. And they would, raise up, they would be raised up to be chief elders within the church and there they would share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church would get, began to continue to grow and flourish. And what Steve Addison says is as the story of Acts unfolds, we see that ordinary people were the key players in the spread of the gospel. Through them, the good news spread to families, friends, and neighbors. I would say to you today that if the church is going to grow today and the gospel is going to be spread, it may have to do with persecution, but it will ordinary people at the helm, spreading the gospel in their neighborhoods and their workplaces, to their friends in their schools, following the leading of the Holy Spirit to do sometimes some things that may seem out of the ordinary, but when you do them, if they are led by the Spirit, God uses that to convict, to draw, to change people's lives. I want to ask if you would to stand. 
I don't know if you know the story of Desmond Doss. If you know that story, would you raise your hand? Maybe you might know it if I said this. Did, did anyone watch the movie that came out a, a few years ago called Hacksaw Ridge? I don't know if you saw that story. It was the story of Desmond Dawes. Desmond was an unlikely hero. But he received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Truman. However, Doss did not kill one single enemy soldier in the war that he served in. In fact, due to his religious obligations, he didn't even carry a weapon. He refused to, which caused a lot of consternation. He ended up serving on the medic team. And Doss was at Okinawa in May of 1945 as American troops fought against the defending Japanese. The battle was brutal. And if you've ever seen a picture of him, of Desmond Doss, he was a small frame. They picture him that way in the movie, and he was. He was a small frame, very skinny guy. Matter of fact, um, the picture of him serving at that time shows him with, you know, they used to have like the bomb, bomb metal helmets, and it looked like it was like twice the size of his head. Yet, at this battle at Okinawa, as they were under heavy fire, the battle was brutal. Many U.S. soldiers were left injured on this place called Hacksaw Ridge. He had to climb up this steep embankment, cliff-type embankment. And as they came across, they were waiting. And many were injured and finding it impossible to get out, much less to try to repel themselves down. And Doss, in an extraordinary act of courage, that day, rescued approximately 75 lives while he himself was under fire. He would go and this small frame man would grab a soldier and drag him back and let him down to safety and go back in to the battle and grab another wounded soldier and drag him back. 75 times this man who undoubtedly many of his counterparts would have looked at on draft day and thought how is this guy going to help especially if he's not carrying a gun yet he made an impact to save 75 men's lives that day and each time he rescued a soldier his prayer was this his prayer was not, Lord, stop this. You can stop this. And I believe God could. But his prayer was, Lord, give me help and strength to get one more. And he would go back and he would get another and he would drag him. What if that was our prayer today? Too often, our prayer in the church is, God, we want to grow. God, we want to see souls saved, but make it easy, God. Mm. We don't say it that way. That's what we mean. We say it a thousand different ways, but that's what it means. That's what he hears. God, send them in. God, if you'll bring them and put them in the altar with tears in their eyes, then we'll accept them. What you're saying is, God, we want to see the church grow. We want to see the faith grow if you'll make it easy. If you'll just let me get up and go through the motions and do what I've always done, let me feel good, my hands stay clean, and God will accept the growth you sin. That wasn't his prayer. That wasn't Desmond Dawson's prayer. That wasn't the prayer of the people of Acts. Their prayer was, God, give us boldness. God, give us strength. Let us go right back in. Share the gospel. Tell the good news. Let us make a difference in somebody's lives. And as they did, day by day by day by day, the church was being multiplied and spread throughout the region up into the Gentile nations. 
became like a wildfire. Father, today I pray that you would help us to have that same boldness and desire. God, give us that prayer as we stand here today, a prayer for boldness, a prayer for strength and courage. God, help us save just one more with the gospel of Jesus Christ.